Joining me now to shed a little bit light on this and give us his insight, we have Mark Grant, Managing Director, Southwest Securities, and also a Bloomberg News reporter, Jim Sterngold. Jim, just set the stage for us. What exactly is MF Global? What was the business that it was in, and how did this happen? Well, MF Global is a different business today than it was five or ten years ago. It was originally just a pure broker. It went out and did transactions, collected a commission, fairly low margin business, but you do make some money on the balances you hold from your big customers. That's a great strategy when interest rates are relatively high and you have an opportunity to get a decent return. In a way, what the business they're in now was they decided our returns are too low. We want to start to get some uh, increased revenues from proprietary trading, take positions, which is what uh, Goldman Sachs was so good at under John Corzine for a time. So he tried to goose up Government that. Government bond trader, right? U.S. Treasuries. Absolutely. And this has worked for some firms, but this is an incredibly treacherous environment, even for someone with Corzine's experience. So today, they're a proprietary trader. They take positions as well as that traditional commission business. And that's what seems to have caught them up. Mark Grant, come in on the topic of MF Global. How significant is this bankruptcy filing? And if you can, make the distinction for us between creditors and those that hold counterparty risk? Uh, it was the eighth largest uh, bankruptcy in the country's history. It is not as significant, in my opinion, as the Lehman issue, but I do think it's more significant than the market has given it credit for to date. The real issue, as you just pointed out, is the creditors, and we know who the creditors are because they were in the uh, bankruptcy filing, but the much bigger issue is going to be the counterparty obligations. Uh, you can bet that MF Global was leveraged probably to the tune of 12 or 15 times. They were in the futures market. They were in the CDS market. They were in the uh, primary dealer for the Fed. So. There are derivatives there. There's going to be lots that's going to come out in the next few days. And I think it's going to be more significant than many people think uh, at present. Jim Sternkold, so what happens next in a bankruptcy filing? You get a judge who is appointed to oversee this process, mm -hmm. and you match the liabilities against the assets, against the, the credits that are available. What about the people that are owed money by MF Global? Are they just going to have to sit around and wait? Uh, that's the unfortunate thing. And frankly, I did speak with some very large private investors last week, private companies that had large accounts with MF Global. They were all pulling their accounts out because they didn't want to get caught in a bankruptcy process. People will get to their money, most of it anyway, at some point, but it could be months away. And so right now the process slows down. They try to come up with an orderly transition. It looks like they're, they've obviously spent the weekend trying to sell off all or pieces of the business. Nothing's happened yet. So there's some kind of liquidation that we're moving towards, perhaps. Mark Grant, one of the issues of MF Global Holdings had to do with $6.3 billion worth of European debt. This is debt that the company purchased of Greece, of Ireland, of Belgium, of Spain, of Italy, and so on. Do you think that there are more companies that have this exposure that we're not necessarily clear about? Oh, absolutely. Every major trading bank, investment bank in the country has exposure to the uh, foreign markets either directly in terms of the sovereign debt or through the CDS market. One of my great concerns right now is that the uh, Greek haircut, which uh, the headline is 50 percent, but the real number since the ECB and the IMF are not going to take the haircut is around 30 percent or if they're not going to make the Greeks take the haircut, the pension funds, it's only 16 percent. But the governing group for the uh, credit default swaps market has said this won't trigger the insurance on these things. So there could be lots of fallout uh, uh, potentially because of that issue. Mark Grant, when you say that the International Monetary Fund and the European Central Bank will not take a haircut, what do you mean? They are not going to accept a decrease in the value of, let's say, their Greek debt holdings? That is exactly right, Pim. What they've done is differentiate themselves as sovereign entities from all the private debt holders, so they're not going to accept the uh, markdown, which to me is really unbelievable. The press hasn't focused on it much, but it just shows the tremendous disparity that's taking place right now 
between uh, Europe and between the investment community. Jim Sterngold, this sounds like mark to market all over again, doesn't it? Uh, we have been through this through a lot of, uh, through the whole 2007, 2008, 2009 period. And, you know, the markets are still struggling. Look at some of the big banks like Bank of America. They're trading at uh, roughly 30 odd percent of their book value because the, the markets have said, we don't like the marks that we're seeing, uh, that they're publicly stating we're going to make our own. We don't know the value of the book. I would point out one thing real quickly. It reminds me, uh, I was at a conference about a year ago that the CME had down in Florida, and uh, one of the big speakers was John Corzine. He was a rock star. He had just got to MF Global. Great things were going to happen. I had dinner with some of his people. They were talking about all the excitement and the morale. The fact that they've been hit with this bankruptcy uh, really tells you something about the kind of markets we're in and how treacherous it is. We're gonna, Jim, you know, this idea of buying debt of sovereign nations, all right, I guess on the surface anyone can do it, but where were the board of directors of MF Global? Aren't they supposed to look out for the shareholders, which apparently, if you take a look at the halt and trading of MF Global stock, are going to be left with nothing? The equity holders are going to be left with little, if anything. Look, John Corzine was the genius who was going to transform MF Global from a kind of sleepy uh, commission-generating firm to uh, a big investment bank. They were going to be a broker-dealer. They were going to be a primary dealer. They were going to have proprietary trading. And so this was the man that they entrusted their, uh, the, basically, the entire firm to. And like I said, I was at this conference a year ago. He was a rock star. The whole industry thought this was a fantastic thing. Uh, he had just come across off of uh, being uh, senator and governor. So the board's big decision was saying, John, you're our guy. What about the Volcker rules? The idea that from uh, former Federal Reserve Chief uh, Paul Volcker that banks should not be speculating with their money. They should be basic utilities. In fact, he describes what the biggest innovation in banking in the last 50 years is the ATM card. Right. Look, th this is... Banks will tell you th there is no resolution to this debate except for somebody imposing a resolution. Banks will tell you they don't speculate. They take reasonable positions, they hedge most of their positions, and what happened in 2008 was proof of two things. First of all, that they often don't know how, mo how much risk they really do have, and secondly, that your hedge is only as good as your counterparty. And when the counterparties start blowing up, the whole thing goes up in flames. So his attitude really is, as you said, and, and this needs to be stressed, that he wants to turn the business into almost a utility Paul Volcker does, yes. Paul Volcker. He wants to make, as long as they are going to get the protection of the FDIC, which in effect is the government backing, even though they have an industry-supported fund, insurance fund, he feels that in return for that, there should be an emphasis on safety so you don't have blow-ups. Now, if there's another part of the, of the business that they can keep separate, and they want to use their proprietary desk to take all kinds of flyers, God love him, let him do it. He just doesn't want the insurance fund and therefore eventually the taxpayer to have to bear any of that risk. Well, I'm glad you mentioned this idea of, you know, what the bank's capital is, because in Europe we're going through this issue of bank recapitalizations. Mark Grant, this idea that Europe will have to somehow find new funding sources for their banks, you were looking earlier today at the cost of banks lending to each other in Europe. What's that telling you about how they feel about their counterparties? They don't trust each other. <clears throat> they shouldn't trust each other. The whole notion, by the way, of uh, uh, the IMF telling the European banks they needed 250 billion euros to recapitalize, and then they said, no, all we need is 106 billion to recapitalize. And then they performed a scam that they did in two ways. And I'll just say it just like that. One, they said, well, we have profits in, in German bonds and we have profits in British bonds, so we're going to offset the profits in the bonds versus the loss in the Greek bonds. And then they went on to pull some other very questionable uh, financial practices having to do with the weight rating of certain averages. And in the end, and I did the, ca the uh, calculations, and it was in my commentary that you saw this morning, Pim, all they're doing is putting up about $15.4 billion, which is like putting a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. Well, Mark Grant, does this mean that the cost for borrowing, if you're an Italian or you're a Spaniard or indeed a Greek, that the cost is going to be prohibitive? We're talking about, what, five-year debt for Italy? Six percent. 
Well, the, the ten-year, the ten-year uh, went very poorly for Italy, uh, Italy recently. Their ten-year auction, and now the uh, Italian ten years around a 608 yield. But people are just walking out on Europe. A lot of the big institutions that I speak with personally, they just don't want to fund. They just don't want to have money over there. They think the risk is just too great. St Jim Sterngold, the idea of a bank run, is that fueled by liquidity issues? In other words, you can't get that overnight funding so people just start withdrawing their money, whether it be retail or indeed even institutional investors? Well, look, MF Global was in a sense a victim of a type of bank run. I, I know from having spoken to some of their big customers that they were liquidating their positions and withdrawing their, their funds from uh, their accounts. And in, in addition, they're very reliant on uh, short-term funding from inside the market that I'm sure was drying up. So these they had to draw on, on these revolving credits uh, from the banks, which they immediately got to their limit. So that was a kind of bank run. That can happen anywhere, anytime. It's triggered really by two things. One is fear that everybody else is going to pull their uh, their accounts, and so therefore you want to be first out the door rather than last out the door. And the other is if you believe they're genuinely insolvent. My guests are Jim Sterngold of Bloomberg News, also with us, Mark Grant, Managing Director, Southwest Securities. Also want to bring in Mike England now, joining us from Action Economics. He's coming to us from Denver, Colorado. Mike England, this idea that the Greek people might actually vote in a referendum on the debt renegotiations and the debt plan for Europe, do you think that it would pass? Well, you know, I think it's going to be touch and go. Each of these little barriers that we've encountered on the on the political front in Europe has been a difficult a hurdle to cross. There are quite a few hurdles to come. It's not clear to what degree Europe in total, and Greece being a microcosm and perhaps the front runner on this, really have the, has the stomach for the kind of austerity that they're facing, really has the commitment to a common currency, which ultimately is going to be the question that's raised, and whether or not the broader uh, financial system can handle this uh, divergence of political preferences between the countries and yet some common interest rate and common inflation rate. These may not really fit together at all. Mark Grant, if there was a referendum on the Greek uh, debt renegotiation plan and these uh, write-downs as we described them, do you think that it would pass the Greek electorate? Polls, uh, Pim, show that 60 percent of the people in Greece are against uh, the austerity measures and the new uh, measures imposed by the EU. And then if you think this through a little bit, if they reject them, which means that Greece would go back to the European Union and say, no deal, we're not doing it, that would basically be the end game because Greece wouldn't get any more money. And Greece would, I suppose, at that point, uh, just dissolve itself from the European Union and issue its own currency. And then, of course, they would refuse to pay any of their debts, their sovereign debt, bank debt, municipal debt, their $90 billion in derivatives debt, and just walk away and say, that's it. Jim Sterngold, come in on this topic of the money that has currently been allocated to help Greece. There have been reports, I was reading some over the weekend, that many people in Greece, and indeed government officials, what they say is the money that they've received, all it's really done is go to pay the debt, going to pay creditors. And none of that money has filtered into the economy. And as a result, with the economy in Greece contracting, there's no support for these type of austerity measures. Well, that is the problem, which is this is heading toward a shrinking economy rather than a growing economy. This is not an atmosphere to make people really enthusiastic about this measure. I mean, maybe I, I miss the drachma. Maybe that would be a, a good thing for some people. But realistically, the, the issues that I assume that the politicians are going to stress is the question isn't just do you like this package from the EU or not? How do you feel about the alternatives, which are possibly even worse austerity? Mike England, would there be an effective European Union takeover of Greece? Because if the Greek people don't vote for these austerity packages, how would they implement them? You know, one way of looking at this vote is there's probably no viable scenario that would actually pass a referendum without the kind of political conflict and debate going into the election to get the people of Greece to rethink. The real question is, why don't they allow a Greek currency to, to devalue? That historically has been the route these countries have taken. The peripheral countries tend to overspend. They tend to devalue. That essentially self-corrects. As long as they're connected to the eurozone, as long as they have a common currency, they've essentially had the normal political escape route closed to them. So there probably is no politically viable 
option in Greece. They have to pick among outcomes they're probably not going to like. Mark Grant, if indeed Greece were to issue its own currency, wouldn't it still be left with all those euro-denominated debts? Well, sure, but they're a sovereign country. You, you raised a very interesting question earlier in our conversation today. A corporation acts under the laws of a country. A sovereign nation, Greece, they make the laws. They, Greece could say, we're not paying back all the European debt, and that would be it, and there'd be nothing else to say about it, unless you want to go to war, because there's nobody that can force the government to pay the debt. But having said that, Mark Grant, don't pension funds, insurance funds, as well as other retirement funds in Greece hold a lot of Greek euro-denominated debt? That is absolutely true, but let's think it through, Pim. All that Greece would have to do is pay the people in Greece, pay the pension funds in Greece, and not pay anybody in uh, Europe or America or any of the other holders of the debt because they're a sovereign nation. They make the laws, and that might be the law they put in place. I want to thank you very much. Mark Grant joining us, Managing Director, Southwest Securities. Also, my thanks to Jim Sterngold, Bloomberg News reporter.